Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome back. Um, sorry we don't have more Carolina blue skies for you, but at least it's not raining and it's still beautiful out. Uh, I'm Katherine Nichols. I'm Senior Coordinator for Faculty Relations and Travel at the GAA. We're really thrilled to have you all back for the weekend. Just a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, we found having people, if you have any questions for any of our presenters throughout the day, we have some note cards on the table. If you could just write them and we'll, I'll be around, my colleague Douglas will be back and then Paula will also be around. Just hold them up and we'll come get them and we'll read them to the presenter. We just find it makes the Q&A go a little bit faster. And we should have time for Q&A for all of the presenters. Um, I'm very happy to welcome Elaine Westbrook to our first session today. She is Vice Provost of University Libraries and University Librarian. Elaine came to UNC in 2017 after spending some time at University of Michigan as the Associate University Librarian for Research. Prior to that, she was at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln and also at Cornell. She has a BA in, in Linguistics and an MLIS in Digital Research Libraries from the University of Pittsburgh. We hope you'll enjoy hearing how this, our libraries are not your grandmother's libraries. So please welcome Elaine. Thank you, Catherine, for that introduction. Um, you know, I'm so ha happy to be here. I've never been in this space. I've always heard about the Blue Zone, <laughs> so now I'm like, yes, I get to be here. Um, but I really do want to thank um, the GAA and Catherine for um, inviting me here, and this has been um, a great experience. And I've been traveling a lot fundraising and doing things. And so I was in Minneapolis last night and it was about 50 degrees and it rained the whole time. It was, it was horrible. It was, I mean, I love Minneapolis, but the weather was just <laughs> terrible. But the only thing that saved the trip was um, I get on the plane and I sat next to Luke May all the way from Minneapolis. <laughs> and I was trying not to act crazy, you know, like I was so excited. And I didn't want to, you know, interrupt him. You know, he's playing his video games. He called his mom, and and I wanted to know. I'm like, what are you doing here? Are you going to make, Are you going to graduate? You know, I didn't ask him all that because I just thought I would look too goofy. Um, but I did introduce myself, and he said, um, you know, I told him I was a university librarian, and I said my office is in Davis Library, and he said, he said I have spent so many hours in Davis Library, and I said. Um, that is wonderful, <laughs> like I love, and I wish I, you know, I wanted to say, can I get that in, you know, on video, and can you write it down, and so my husband was like, well, did you take a picture, and I said, no, I didn't take a picture, and because he's sitting there, and people are coming up to him the entire time, and I just felt like, you know, I, he, the man deserves peace, so I just, I just let him go, but I just had to tell you that story, it was just, you know, I don't know if I'll ever you know, get the, get the chance to sit next to, you know, someone who sinks winning shots that lead to national championships. And, and he's just, just seemed like a, such a nice person. You know, I was just, you know, blown away. Okay, so, um, you know, I say that we're not your grandmother's library, and I really mean that because the technologies around us have changed so much, right? And so, that idea that you have to go to the library, like that's the only place you can get information and knowledge, I mean, those days are over, right? So I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about how libraries are quite different now and some of the things that are happening on this campus that I think are really important because I believe that one, great universities have great libraries, and two, I believe that our library system is a differentiator. And so what I mean by that is students who come to Carolina get something special because of the library, something that they don't get at other universities, a very unique experience. Um, and I think that's something that I always tell my boss, the provost, is, you know, we really have to be in that business of making Carolina stand out. And there's already great faculty, there's great researchers, all these things are there, 
But the library, I think, is a major infrastructure that is really important. And so I just wanted to give you a sense of why we're, we're so awesome. I mean, I'm, I'm very biased, I have to say, but we, we really are one of the premier libraries of North America. And, um, and these numbers are actually a little bit off. This slide is, um, needs to be updated. But right now, we're about we're around 300 staff, and you see we have almost as many students who work in the library as full-time staff. And, um, and we're actually the largest employer of students on campus. And I think the one thing I want to call your attention to are the graduate students, 64. We actually are the number one employer of graduate students as well. So we have graduate students who come in and do um, internships. Largely, they're from the humanities. And so we have English, Comp, Lit, American Studies that come in. And they often work in Wilson Library, but they also work in Davis Library, and they work in the undergrad throughout our, our system. And then the other thing is we have the four big libraries that we have. Now, we have nine libraries, but there are four big ones. And of course, that's Davis, the undergraduate library, um, the Health Sciences Library, and of course, Wilson. And then the other thing is the 10 million volumes, and that's, again, what makes us special, is having 10 million volumes puts us in a rarefied space where there aren't many libraries that have those deep collections. And um, you know, our partners down the street, uh, the ones that have read, uh, and then there's a dark blue partner down the street, <laughs> you know, we, we're actually, um, we're doing better than they are. And I think, <laughs> I mean, there's nothing against those, those universities, but we really have, since 1960, we have been one of the fastest growing libraries in, the, in, the, in North America, and I'm really proud of that. And then the final thing, as I mentioned, the 10 million is really important um, number that I really stand by, and I don't know how many of you, you know, you go to the pit, and there's this guy, and he's a preacher, and he keeps telling people, that we have six million volumes. And I'm like, dude, no, <laughs> like, like I, whatever you preach, you need to tell the world that we have 10 million volumes. There's a big difference between 10 million and six million. So um, I don't know if you'll see him while you're on campus today, but if you hear him saying six million, I, I would love all of you to correct him, say the library has 10 million, okay. Um, so I, I use this quote everywhere I go, and Lewis Round Wilson, was the first university librarian, I'm the 10th. Um, he said this pretty much on a daily basis, that the library is the pulsing heart. And I believe that, and I believe that was true in 1929 um, when he was here. He was the first university librarian and he held that position for 31 years. And he um, got a building named after him. But also, Lewis Brown Wilson was also pivotal in the creation of the press. This, uh, the um, Alumni Association, the SEALs, um, the School of Information Libraries. I mean, I can go on and on um, for the contributions that L Lewis Round Wilson made to this university. He was a giant, and I'm delighted and honored to have this role and to follow um, along, um, to follow after Lewis Round Wilson. And this being the pulsing heart is something that I promote, but we have to live it and we have to demonstrate that this is who we are. So I have to, to go with the founder story, and this is the first book. Um, this is a book of sermons from the uh, Reverend um, Thomas Wilson. And just to give you the background, this book um, is from 1792. And the, what's most important about this book is this book formed the library which existed in 1792. That's before the old well, before old east, before there were desks, pencils. <laughs> and so this book that we have in our collection um, really is the foundation of, of higher ed, of public education, because it was here and we're the first public university. And so to have this book, it really is symbolic of the beginning of public education in, in the United States. And, um, and so the side story is in 1871, we lost the book. And so it was, and don't worry, we have it, we have it. It's, we're never gonna lose any more books again. 
Um, but we lost it um, once when the library closed after the Civil War. It was you know the, actually the whole campus, the university closed. I think between 1871 and 1875, it disappeared. So fortunately, Brown University um, had a copy, and they gave us a copy, and then we got another copy. So we have two copies of this book, and one always sits with the um, Board of Trustees, and the other one sits in Wilson Library. Okay, so the thing that we're known the most for is special collections, right? Now, how many of you have been in, in Wilson Library at some point in your... Okay, so that is the heart of our special collections, and that is what we're known for, is having the history of the South right here. And, and that's something that, again, I'm really proud of to say that we have the largest collection of materials devoted to a single state in the North Carolina collection. Our rare book collection is one of the best in the um, world. We also have a Southern Folklife collection, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And the Southern Historical Collection is one of our biggest collections. Um, this item comes from our rare book collection. And believe it or not, this is, this is not the tiniest book we have. We have one smaller than this. And this is a Bible, <laughs> right? Um, but again, this just goes to show you that when we have these special collections of rare materials, they come in all shapes and sizes, and we have scholars from all over the world who come here to use our amazing collections. And the biggest population of people who use our collections are students. All right, so, you know, I opened up with Luke May. Um, I, I, I wanted to tell him this story about the papers, but I thought, you know, uh, he probably wouldn't get into that. But the last year we acquired um, the Dean Smith papers, and so these were, largely scrapbooks, diaries, correspondences, and it really tells this amazing story of Dean Smith and how he managed to connect with former players long after he retired from basketball. I mean, he was an amazing person, and so in this collection we have his report cards from Emporia, Kansas. We have um, the letters that he received from Michael Jordan and letters from James Worthy. And I mean, it's just a really um, amazing treasure trove that we have been able to um, digitize and bring in. And so we have scholars who study this university who are using these papers. This is not something that you would say is for sports fans. This is for people who study um, leadership, people study sports. But also, if you're interested in history of Carolina, you have to of course, be interested in Dean Smith. So the other thing I wanted to mention is just the rich collections. We have the special collections at Wilson, but we also have these amazing collections that are in the other eight libraries. And, and that's something that we're really proud of. And I mentioned that in 1960, we had one million volumes, and now we have 10 million volumes. And so there was a deep commitment to saying that we need a collection to support the research and teaching and learning of this campus. So we need the social sciences, we need to focus on you know, public health and pharmacy and medicine, um, the arts, the humanities, everything we need to have here to be a premier institution. You have to have an amazing library. So I, I mentioned earlier the Southern Folklife Collection. So the Southern Folklife Collection is our fastest growing collection, and it is composed of millions of audio files. And, and so we are trying to archive the audiovisual heritage of the South. So we have amazing collections of bluegrass, the blues, jazz, anyone affiliated with, the with North Carolina is in this collection the chocolate drops, I mean, I could go on and on. And we actually have deals with record labels and so that we are able to acquire those audio files. And so for um, someone like Doc Watson, Earl Scruggs, I mean, these are really famous North Carolinian musicians. We need to archive that. That's the history of the state. That's the history of this university. And it's the history that we are committed to preserving. So we got $1.7 million from the Mellon Foundation, and that actually is gonna put us at the top. 
now we're going to be one of the best places in the world to focus on digitizing audiovisual materials. Because there's a lot of documents, but everything's not in print. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is this virtual museum that a lot of people don't know. It's the library that hosts it. It's a library that sources it. And we have digitized millions of files dedicated to archiving and documenting the history of the university. And this is just one of the examples of the, um, the history that we're interested in, the history of the student. So for many of you, we're, we want to be able to say, what, what was it like to be a student in 75? What was it like to be a student in 82? And be able to document that. That's really important. 80 years from now, people need to know what your experience was when you were here at this university. The other thing I wanted to mention is this, um, our commitment to the state. And so we, we have this um, North Carolina Digital Heritage Center. And what we do is we get on the road, we go to every county, or actually I'll take that back, We're, we've gone to 81 counties. And we digitize scrapbooks, yearbooks, anything that we could find that people have in their churches, people have them from their high schools, historical societies. And it's been amazing what we've been able to do. We are trying to provide that expertise that we have. And so we're able to go out and we have high quality equipment, scanners and photos or, or cameras that we're able to capture this information that a lot of these communities could never do on their own. So our goal is by the end of next year, we will hit all 100 counties. This gives you a sense of the growth and how we are committed to preserving, archiving, making the material available. Now, part of it is we have millions and millions of items right here in Wilson Library. But now we really want to empower communities to be able to archive and digitize things for themselves. And so we host it online, but they get to keep their materials because I think it's important that they get to, um, they have agency and they're able to make decisions about what they want to do with it. Okay, so the student success is the thing actually I want to talk about the most because I think that's what's different about libraries now that didn't really exist, I would say, 15 years ago or maybe even 10 years ago. So the, uh, this is a picture from our special collections and it really is about how do we get students in there and like I said, that special unique experience at Carolina, how do we get them in here? And so in this example, we have a professor named Jean Moskal, who's an English and comp lit, and she's an expert in um, Mary Shelley. And so it was the anniversary of Frankenstein, and so she brought our class in to do uh, an exhi um, exhibition, and it's a student curated exhibition. And so I'm gonna show this video clip now just to give you a sense of how the students responded to this activity. So if you could play that now. <laughs> I love working with the rare books. Getting to hold the old books and the feel of that like book dust coming off under your hands and just finding things within them that other people might have forgotten but you get to see again, that is going to be something that I'm going to remember. It's just astounding to see all this information just put before us. We saw books from Benjamin Franklin, books from the 1400s. I would have never taken the time out of my day to go and search these books, research these books, and this class gave me an awesome opportunity to be able to do that. I really didn't know much about rare books, and I definitely gained so much respect for the texts themselves. This class really allows you to dive deeply into something that you really didn't know much about in the beginning. It allows you to work with amazing people and incredible resources, so I think that's definitely something I've come to appreciate. I've learned a lot about book preservation and looking at different authors and using these books to kind of contextualize what Mary Shelley's world was like when she wrote Frankenstein in 1818. I think it's a completely different experience when you see the works, what they looked like, how they were printed. It's also interesting just to go through other people's things to kind of get a sense of like who they were and what it was to live at a particular point in history. And so I think it's important to get students into the library, especially Wilson, to show them that libraries contain so much more than, you know, stacks of books. 
I've loved working in the library. It's become one of my favorite places on campus. I love getting to see all of the original works that we have. We have such a wide collection. Just seeing all this history that are in these books is incredible. It's one of the most unique classes I've taken at Carolina so far. It's all about creating and just focusing on the time that you have in class and really getting to explore the works that we have in our exhibit. It's a unique experience that I wouldn't have gotten anywhere else and that I have truly become a better researcher and student because of it. So that's in their own words, they're talking about this amazing experience they had. And that's, that's the, the thing that we have to keep doing. And not just with Wilson, but even in the other libraries that we have is they have to get these meaningful experiences that they're going to remember forever. All right. Still curious. We'll go on. So the other thing I wanted to mention with regard to student success is we celebrated the 50th anniversary of uh, R.B. House Undergraduate Library last year. And it was one of those moments where we could take stock and look back at why is it that we have an undergraduate library. Most institutions in North America have gone away with undergraduate libraries. There used to be about 20 undergraduate libraries. Now there are only four left. And here at Carolina, I believe that we will keep having an undergraduate library to demonstrate our commitment to undergraduate students and their special and unique needs. And so we're gonna double down on that commitment and be unique and really set up those services that we think are important for retaining students so students have a sense of belonging to this university and also so that they can learn to be better students, better writers, um, and better leaders. And, and largely to be better global citizens. That's, that's why we have these amazing libraries and that's why you know, I get up every morning is we have to help these students go out and change the world. And I believe that the library is a big part of that. So we had our celebration and we had students tell us, why do you like the undergrad library? And, and so we have, I have hundreds of these, but the idea that you can get everything in one place. Some people think it feels like a living room and that it's really a home away from home that students can go and get some really great help from librarians um, who were there. So the other part that I've mentioned is this whole idea of digital mastery. So of course when I was in school, it, it, you know, social media wasn't the big thing and there were a lot of things that just weren't online. And so now what I've learned is about half of the, the projects that students work on are audiovisual products that they have to deliver. So they're not necessarily writing papers. They are creating films. They are um, doing podcasts. They're doing these, di they're creating these digital projects. And so the undergraduate library is that place that teaches students how to do that. It teaches students how to understand digital information, how to understand digital visual information, how to understand digital data. And so these are these literacies that we think are really important for students to be successful is to be able to manipulate information, be able to understand information, real news from fake news. That's what we focus on at the undergraduate library. The other thing we do is we have a world-class um, information and library science program called SILS. It's been consistently ranked in the top five for the past 30 years. And we play an integral role in educating the future librarians. And so this is something we take really seriously. This, this picture is an um, example of our makerspace. And we have students who are trained in making pedagogy, and they come to the library and they learn how to integrate making into the curriculum. And so this is a librarian there, um, Kyle. He, um, unfortunately, he went to the, the red school down the street. <laughs> but I think it's important that we were able to train him and to provide him those experiences that made him a great candidate. And he's been doing some wonderful things at state, so I'm really um, proud of him for that. So the other thing that I want to talk about is nowadays, you know, with the social media, students um, are just stressed, right? And the library is a place where you see a lot of stressful students. Um, 
just last week I was in the elevator and I saw this student and she, she just didn't look well. And so I said, you know, are, are you okay? And she said, you know what, I cannot find a place to study. I've been on every floor in Davis Library and, and I felt terrible. I mean, it was packed, you know, you're literally stepping over students, <laughs> they're just everywhere. And so I had, um, I said, well, just come with me. And so I, I went to one of the librarians. I said, look, there, there has to be some nook that people just don't know about. And so she wrote down three places. One's on the third floor, one's on the seventh floor, and wrote it down. And then went with the student and said, look, I think you're going to find a spot. And, and they found a spot. And she was so grateful. Um, but that's part of the thing that we've noticed is just this level of stress is really high. And so we actually, the library, we invented the week of balance. We invented the week to say we need to help students cope. And so we're gonna, I'm gonna show you a clip of something we do at the um, Health Sciences Library that is um, become pretty popular these days. Um, and it starts with pet therapy. So I get a text and I hear that there's ponies on campus and I'm like, what? I've been here studying for like a week and a couple of my friends came and got me. And Take the elevator up to the fifth floor. I walk in and I'm just like, wow, there are ponies in the HSL right now. Finals are stressful. These horses kind of help relieve some of that. Like just bringing the ponies into the library, there are people taking selfies. Like it takes like 20 minutes to get them in because people are like, what is going on? Like, you know, these ponies. Now I have to say, Kiwi is the most popular pony and he has his own Twitter account. So I follow Kiwi and it's a great, you know, he tweets all the time. Um, but this idea is, is that we had to figure out different kinds of pet therapy, so we actually have horses, we have cats, and we have puppies. And, and so now I'm like, oh, that's getting boring. Like maybe we need to be looking at like, you know, alpaca or, you know, or, or lizards. I don't, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just thinking out loud. But I think at some point, I, I think the ponies are definitely a big hit. And, um, and I think that we'll continue to expand. But this is one of those areas that libraries just didn't really do it. Campuses didn't do it. And now we really have to do it. It's really important for their wellness and um, to be able to, to, to not focus on their studies, but to just take a moment to step back so that they can be um, just more calm and prepared for their finals and things like that. So that's something we really like doing. And so that was at the Health Sciences Library. Um, so the Health Sciences Library, we're gonna celebrate our 60th anniversary next year. So You'll be seeing a lot of information coming out at the end of this year to celebrate that. Uh, we have one of the best health sciences libraries in North America. It's consistently ranked in the top five. And it makes sense because we have such great health programs here. The medical school is top, pharmacy school, public health. These are amazing programs, nursing. Um, and we need to have a great library to support that research. The other thing I wanted to mention with regard to the state is we have set up the centers across the entire state to help educate people with health information. And so we believe that when, you know, unfortunately people get sick, people get ill, and it's important that they have information to be able to be informed about their conditions. And so we have these centers, they're called AHEC centers, and we're distributed and we manage the digital information, but we want to get this information in the hands of patients. And, and so the Health Sciences Library is really core in thinking about the future of healthcare, rural health, digital health, all these things that are really important to the future of society. This is something I wanted to mention is just this digital health device collection. And it's all about these um, biometrics. And, and so what we, you know, when we think about collections, you think about books, but we actually have dozens and dozens of devices that people come to check out. 
so that they can experiment. And so we have students and faculty and researchers who come. Anybody could come. You could come and if you want to um, check out something and just to learn more about EKGs or <laughs> anything, you could do it. But this is something that, again, we didn't exist three years ago. And we're the only library in the country that has a collection like this. Other thing I want to mention is augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality. This is big. This is growing. And so what we've been doing is in each library, we've set up tools and stations for students to experiment. And this is an example in the undergrad library. But it really is becoming a technology that I think is going to change higher ed. And we have examples of, of librarians working with faculty who are creating these um, virtual experiences for children in the hospital. They can't leave. And so they're able through augmented reality to get away from their situation, be able to get out and to walk through an aquarium or things like that. So that's something that I really love is at the library, we help everybody. We don't just work with social work. We work with everybody. We work with the college. We work with athletics. We work with the press. We focus on everything. We don't turn away people. And we believe that we democratize learning because students come when they're behind and they want to be able to pick up their skills so that they can be successful. Another thing that we're really focusing on is technology. You could come to the library and get the latest technology to do these geospatial analyses that are really important now. It's called GIS, and we have these stations throughout our libraries, and we've had some really um, amazing experiences. We have classes that come in and use this technology and are able to do some really interesting analyses because we have this technology here. These technologies are not going to be in the residence halls. Um, and, and I think the one thing that I really want to stress is that students are actually only in the classroom about 20%. So a lot of the learning takes place outside of the classroom. And a lot of that learning takes place in the library. So I believe that the library is really a learning environment. And it's supposed to be focused on learning. Here's another example of a lot of the work that we do with the technology so that students, again, can bring up their skills so they're able to um, do these analyses. And, it's, and this is happening across the curriculum, not just the sciences. This is happening in humanities and arts and things like that. And then I mentioned the maker space. This whole idea of this maker pedagogy and this innovation and how making is a big part of um, a creative activity that our students engage in. And the thing I love about it is making can be um, for any discipline, any area, any class, you can incorporate making into it. And so having this makerspace at the Keenan Science Library is something that has become really popular. Now, this is a, I think this is one of the 3D printers. This is a really popular. But one of our most popular items is actually sewing machines. <laughs> you know? Yes, we have, we had about three sewing machines, and we keep getting barraged with requests. So now we have 20. <laughs> and the student, because it's like sewing machines, you can't just, where do you get a sewing machine? But they are really popular with um, costume designers. <laughs> they're also popular with a lot of other areas where they're trying to make and mock up things. And, and there's just nowhere you're going to get a sewing machine. <laughs> so, um, so we're really happy to provide that, that um, technology. And then just to close, you know, I really think about the library as a, as a place where people go for inspiration. People go to contemplate. People go to have these um, collisions, I mean, good collisions. You know? So you have humanists and life scientists and geologists working together. And the library is truly an interdisciplinary space. But in this case, we have our partnership with Arts Everywhere. And so we brought these tap dancers and soccer players into the library. And it was a spectacle. I mean, you could see all those folks there. And um, it was very loud. Tap dancing is very loud. That's, that's something I didn't know. But I have to say, you know, 
I actually don't believe that libraries are always supposed to be quiet places. I think it's perfectly fine to be noisy, loud places, as long as people are having fun and as long as people are learning. And so this was really a great opportunity to work with Arts Everywhere. And I think that every year we think of a project to bring people into the library that focuses on the arts. And this was one of the ones that was probably the most popular one that we had. So um, I'd like to thank you for your time. If you have any questions, there's my email. Thank you. Um, I'm on Twitter a lot. And I do ha well, I have to shout out to um, some people who are on my board who do some amazing work. We have Cliff and Linda Butler, Jean Neville, who are sitting right here, who have been amazing advocates for the library. And I hope that all of you are advocates of, I mean, no one, I mean, let's face it, nobody hates libraries, right? Everybody <laughs> loves libraries. But we have some great advocates here on, on um, this campus, and I'm really grateful. So Catherine, do we, we yeah. have some? Uh, one person asked, do you maintain records on past UNC professors? Yes. We have through our um, archives um, department, we have pretty good records. Once you get before 1900, it gets a little sketchy. <laughs> but if you have some specific questions about a former professor that you had, we can certainly help you with that. So you can contact me, and I'll get you connected with our university archivist who can provide you with that information. Uh, the next one was, um, what can we as alum do to assist you in your causes in association with Carolina's libraries? Yes. So as an alum, there are lots of things you could do. First is um, talk about some of the things you learned here today and, and to remind people how important a library is to a quality education. Um, we have a friends organization, and all of you could be friends of the library, and we have, uh, you could go to the website, and to be a friend, it's a, it's a very um, small donation that you can make. But once you become a friend, you can really learn about our events, and you can get um, knowledge about the things that we're doing, um, more like an insider's look to it. But if you are able to be a friend and help support the library financially, that always helps, because uh, information is increasingly expensive, and the spaces that we maintain constantly need refreshing. So the technologies, like that, that big GIS screen, every four years, you have to refresh that technology. And something like that, you know, that's a, that's a $60,000 piece of equipment. So those are the types of things that are really important to us. And of course, they're books. So if you can advocate, and if you can support the friends and be a member of the friends, and then if you could come to our events and bring friends, that would be the three things I would, I would love for you to do. Okay, we're trying. Um, we had another person ask, who do you contact for assistance in digitizing our community historical collection? Again, I would say um, Nicholas Graham, who's our university archivist, would be the person. You could also contact me, I'll connect you. But if you have some connections with a historical society or a high school or community, please let us know because a lot of them just fall through the cracks. So whoever wrote that, please contact me because if there's a, a community that has materials that need to be preserved, we really want to help. With these hurricanes and things that are happening, I'm very concerned that the history of this state is getting lost. And that's our, that, that's our bread and butter. We are the only place on earth that documents and preserves the history of the state of North Carolina and the University of North Carolina. So yeah, so contact me. Um, let's see. The next question was, why were gloves not used when handling the rare books? And that person has the most beautiful handwriting I've ever seen. Right. I thought okay. they had typed it out. Right, so, so it depends. Um, we've learned that using gloves actually makes it harder to manipulate the book. And so we found that when people put on gloves, they actually harm the books more. So we thought that a little bit of oil from your skin might be better than putting on gloves, fumbling it, and dropping it. <laughs> now, some of our materials are 
priceless, you know, literally, you know, Gutenberg Bibles, Shakespeare folios that are millions of dollars. Um, we do not let people touch those. <laughs> we do not, you cannot touch them. And so it just depends. But the main thing is we want our collections and, and special collections to be accessible. So uh, white gloves is not the way to bring in 18 year olds. <laughs> but, um, but the main thing is we always make sure our collections are safe. So we don't worry about that too much anymore. Is there a single publication that gives an overview of the big libraries, all nine libraries? Yes, if you go to library.unc.edu, um, I believe it's in the about section, that can give you a big overview of who we are. And I think the, um, the other thing that really does a good job of capturing the library is actually the development website um, talks about the future of libraries. And that captures, that, that website captures really all the things that I talked about quite well. So you can go to the library website, library.unc.edu, but you can also go to Office of, of University Development, click on libraries, and you'll see another section there. And then, do you have the records of the Confederate Navy? I heard years ago that you did. Oh, oh, that's a good one. <laughs> I don't know. I, I would be surprised if we didn't. We have a, an amazing archive of anything that has to do with the Civil War. We have the best archive. So I, I could follow up on that, but I don't, do not know off the top of my head. Did anyone else have any other questions? I saw some hands. Oh, okay. yes, yes, sir. <laughs> Could you hold on? Yeah. Yeah, that's um, it's an online collection. I don't know. Um, but I will make sure you see the URL. Da, 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 da. Come on. Come on. Sorry, <laughs> this is slow. That's it. Digitalnc.org. There were other questions yeah, over. Um, is there anything you do to support and encourage public libraries across the state? Yes. <laughs> we have partnerships with Chapel Hill Public Library and Durham Public Library. And we believe that public libraries are tremendously important to community health. So we do some partnerships um, with programming. We also work with them when we, when we go out in communities and digitize content, we often work with the public libraries. Um, yes, we partner as much as we can. I wish we could actually partner more um, because the, the Chapel Hill Public Library is amazing and we support their activities and they support our activities and we, and we try to promote each other. And then what has happened to the stacks in Wilson Library? Are they still the same? <laughs> they, uh, actually, unfortunately, they are. <laughs> we have the 52 stacks and we have the 1977 stacks. And they're, they're still there. They're the ones with the glass flooring. And, um, and I think that we will always have those stacks there. And we're one of the few special collections that have the bulk of our content on site. So when you come to visit, we can actually get it for you. We, you don't have to wait 48 hours or something like a lot of places. Uh, then I I'm gonna read this question. I think we have one more. Can alumni have access to subscription websites? Um, we are working on it, not right now. And I've worked with Doug Dibber to figure out like we have to be able to do this. And it is, it's really complicated, <laughs> but there is a way and you wouldn't necessarily get, con get be able to access nature or cell or these really, you know, big research um, resources, but we're really trying to find a way for you to have access to like the New York Times, some of the basic, um, research services that our students use. And so I believe it might take us another year to figure out a solution. So not right now, but I'm working on it. I've got a very quick comment and then two short questions. Number sure. one, for the people 
who have not been in Wilson Library, there's two special rooms in there. On the back left corner when you walk up the steps, there's a small library, not a small museum. It's extremely interesting. Mm -hmm. And then on the back right corner is one of the prettiest rooms on this campus just to go in there. It's, it's inspirational. Thank and, you. And then there's a small library in the Alumni Center, which is kind of neat and it's hidden away. Uh, first question, uh, you mentioned the first book was with the trustees, and, and then the second question is, besides the five big libraries, what are the other four? Sure, so um, the, we have the, Stills has its own library, we have the Keenan Science Library, we have an art library, and we have the Stone Center Library is the other library. And am I missing one? Oh, the music library. Yeah, the music library I always mix, miss because it's in Wilson Library. Um, and as far as that, you mentioned the first book. The yeah, actually, I'm not, I still had, have to confirm where it actually physically is but the trustees are supposed to have a copy of that book and we have the other copy in our rare book collection in Wilson Library. Yes, sir. With this vast, wonderful collection that you have, how do you share the K-12 culture? Oh, that's a great question. We do a lot of K-12 work, which I think people don't know enough about. Um, but every summer we have several institutes where we bring in teachers from across the state and teach them with primary resources. And so every year we'll have a theme, and, um, and it's been a quite successful program where actually it's not just in the summer, it's throughout the whole year where we have relationships with the um, Public Humanities Group and, and Lloyd Kramer has been a great supporter of the library. He has helped um, us connect with teacher groups and then they also bring tours of students to the library, usually to Wilson, but they also come to the Health Sciences Library and Davis Library as well. Um. I'm sorry to cut you off, but we <laughs> do have to stay on schedule. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank I you. think everyone really enjoyed learning about our library. <laughs> we have a small little gift for you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you.